and let's see how I how I perform. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we're at the end of the day, and um, um, oh, I had this previously somehow some strange thing. My computer it seemed to jump by itself. Okay, let's try to keep this uh, thing. So so yeah, where where Jonas uh, leaves a uh, you know big space to fill somehow. I, with thirty years of experience of machine learning, I, I can maybe add my uh, my one year of trying as well. Um, <laughs> well, that speaks speaks for itself. Huh? Um, okay, so I'd like to talk about something rather mundane and and and, and maybe um, at, at a slightly different edge to 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 many of the talks. Many of the talks are, are very. Uh, um, uh, ambitious in some sense, and I'm going to be basically on the on the other side of the spectrum. I'm 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 talking about reversible systems, and I really would like to talk about structure somehow. So, which I think is important, which I haven't seen many people talk about here, is about structure and learning, not just approximate something, but actually to try to understand something from it. So, um, as I, I've been working in um, uh, dynamical systems with structure, I'm I'm particularly interested in that. So, we came across this kind of opportunity basically to to try to learn. Uh, some dynamical system with structure, and, and as I've been working on reversible systems for a while, um, this seems like a good opportunity, and maybe not entirely obvious of how to do this. So I'd like to report on this. So this is here is a very old slide. I think the last time I showed this was more than ten years ago. Uh, so I've dug it up somewhere. So this is a time reversal symmetry idea. Um, the idea is that we, if, if we have a symmetry in a Hamiltonian system, for instance, p goes to minus p. Then we know this kind of has to do uh, basically for the Hamiltonian it has to do with the fact that if I, if I play a movie of, 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 of system backwards, then what you see is basically see another kind of like a respectable uh, uh, solution of the system. And that means we have some kind of symmetry in, in the phase space where if we, if we apply the, uh, the, the transformation, uh, orbits go to other orbits, but not in the same time direction, in the opposite time direction. Yeah, so there's an idea between but sometimes people call equivariance where, where things are just basically time preserving symmetries, you have also time reversing symmetries. And this is very common in, uh, in Hamiltonian systems and uh, a lot of people use it uh, so now and then. And uh, I'd like to just kind of say a little bit about this uh, just to uh, maybe advertise some things that I've also been doing, but also maybe to give a bit of an impression that there's actually some, something to be uh, appreciated maybe before we go on. So there's not only Hamiltonian systems, but also in this kind of like a reaction diffusion equation, some kind of PDEs with some spatial symmetry. If you look at uh, stationary solutions, uh, then we often get also kind of time reversal symmetry. Many people have worked on that in the, in the, in the last few decades and so, and they, they, they use this and they, they, they use that structure. Now, what's interesting is that people have noticed very early on that somehow there's some kind of similarity between reversible and time reversible and Hamiltonian systems. For instance, if you look at uh, steady states, uh, you see that if, if you have an eigenvalue lambda or, uh, of linearization, then also you get eigenvalue minus lambda. This is true for reversible systems and also for um, uh, Hamiltonian systems. And, and a lot of other properties uh, uh, hold. So as I quote here, you know, Bob Devaney and uh, Clark Robinson. Uh, you know, people uh, found that you have Lyapunov center families. We all know them from, from mechanics courses. We have KM theory, both for reversible systems and also for uh, reverse uh, for uh, Hamiltonian systems, of course, and we also have things like period blow up, we have you know, parameter families of periodic orbits, going to homoclinics, and so on and so on. So there's a lot of the things that are in common, and this uh, has uh, led to lots of speculations about whether there's actually so much difference between reversible Hamiltonian systems, and there was some prevalence at some point, people saying that maybe there's a lot of similarities, but uh, why, why would there be? Because they're not defined in the same way, and of course, there are also kind of interesting differences between them. Um, here, for instance, an example of a, of a, a perfectly kind of like an error preserving flow, which is not at all reversible. It's impossible to find some kind of like line through it that kind of maps the picture into the time reversed system. And you can make this persistent if you make some small time periodic perturbations, for instance, to this. Um, but still, there was some kind of this kind of idea that. Uh, um, reversible systems have two, two sides to them. Maybe they have some kind of conservative behavior like this KM curves and stuff like that, but maybe also dissipate, dissipated behavior because you can, in a reversible system, you can have attractors and repellers and so on and so on, which you, can, you cannot have in Hamiltonian systems. And here's some, uh, some examples. In the left-hand side, you see a picture where you see KM curves, but you also see some curve going into an uh, attractor and actually just uh, 
up from there, there's also a repeller you can't see here because you can't see in the simulation. And on the right hand side, there's a three dimensional reversible mapping where you also see these kind of invariant curves in some sense flying around. You see also clearly some kind of a tractor and uh, these kind of features. So this, yeah, so somehow there was the idea maybe that these things are separated from each other. Maybe there are some kind of like conservative and anticipated behavior in these systems. Uh, but it turns out actually it's, 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 it's much more intricate than that somehow. So in the, in, in, the, in the area preserving setting, we know that the very complicated dynamics in area preserving map is like standard map for us here in the picture. And where we have like, you know, KM curves being accumulated generically by homoclinic tendencies, saddle points, and other elliptic solutions and so on and so on. And we have the kind of new house regions with many saddle and periodic uh, solutions. And you can also do this in the reversible Hamiltonian context. But there's also some results uh, that I'm just kind of using here to, to, to flag is that actually in the reversible setting, we, we have this so-called mixed dynamics, where we know that, for instance, elliptic orbits are accumulated generically as well by things as, as well by uh, sources uh, and elliptic points. Somehow it's completely mixed. There's no separation in these dynamics. It's really uh, complicated. Okay, another, another interesting part, which is just actually only improved this year, is that, for instance, near these kind of regions, in, in, if it was a Hamiltonian system, you would have foliation, kind of like in terms of level sets, where you have horseshoes, if you have saddle points with uh, transverse intersections of stable and unstable manifolds. But in the, uh, in, the, in the reversible setting, you have basically also kind of like uh, chaos, but it doesn't come from horseshoes. It comes from a more complicated uh, setup uh, with, with complicated transport uh, properties. Anyway, that was a bit of a flag of a reversible system. So reversible systems by themselves are interesting. You have reversible Hamiltonian system. I would say the structure matters kind of, you know, these, these results of these systems, they matter what kind of structure you have. And I think it's, it's important, and as, uh, for instance, it's uh, very popular, I think, uh, nowadays, a geometric deep learning uh, by, uh, advocated by Bronstein and, and, and others to kind of like try to kind of use uh, symmetry, but maybe also other kind of like structures uh, and, and take them into account when you, uh, when you do machine learning somehow. So the two approaches now, I think, as, as far as I have seen, either you, you include the structure as some kind of objective in the cost or loss function. You say like, well, I'm trying to approximate something and as part of my approximation, I try to kind of do my best also to preserve a certain structure. So I just put it in my loss function. An alternative way is to hardwire the structure in the learning algorithm. So in, in the bottom, by me, my hardwire is I don't allow to learn anything else than something that has a specific structure. And so what do you get? You get two different types of uh, results. So one, you get structure up to, up, up to the approximation error. Uh, but in the second part, if you hardwire it, of course, the only, you get the structure exactly up to machine precision. So it's just a matter of like, what, what would you like to, to see? So I'm going to pursue objective uh, B. I'm going to try to learn something um, and hardwire somehow the structure into the, into the problem. So the, 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 the case problem, and it was done by, uh, uh, by, by a group of us, and uh, Ricardo Valperga, who's here, uh, was basically the lead. Uh, we tried to kind of like find, find from observations somehow to, to, to approximate some reversible dynamical system or reversible Hamiltonian dynamical system. So what we do is we try to kind of like minimize uh, an error um, between the real uh, mapping and, uh, and, and, and the data that we have. Um, and and uh, sorry, uh, the system that we estimate and the data. And uh, okay, we have to kind of find basically the right hypothesis space. So this is the idea. So we put the hypothesis space now with a certain structure. So for instance, we want a hypothesis space that have reversible uh, properties. So that have the map T so that T is conjugate to its inverse by some map R and it specifies R as a beginning. And of course, uh, this space is very large. So we then have to kind of try to find kind of finite dimension approximations uh, and, and we have to parameterize in some sense these kind of ideas. Yeah. Okay, so is that important or not? Uh, well, here's a very naive uh, example somehow. So true trajectories here lie on something like this is a, a driven pen pendulum uh, with some Hamiltonian. You look at a, a time to, a two pi map of this, and you see on the left hand side some kind of like reason, reasonable phase portrait, on the, on the right hand side some naively learned dynamics where we somehow get the, 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 the iterations uh, right for, for one iteration, but we really lose completely the overall structure. So the idea is you learn here from basically one, one time iterate of many points. Good. So how can we, um, how can we do these kind of things? Well, um, there was some, the, the, in, in completely different context, kind of Dimitri Durayev 
uh, looked at the approximation of Hamiltonian systems uh, earlier, and he found that you basically can actually uh, approximate well um, Hamiltonian systems by compositions of symplectic Hinon maps. So what's nice about this, of course, nice about the structure of symplectic uh, maps is that you that they have a group structure, right? So you can just compose them. So if you that 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 that's 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 a useful structure. So if you get, if you, if you know that you can do this, you can just basically keep composing them. And you can get better and better approximations using that group structure. Now, if you have reversible uh, systems, uh, then we have this kind of uh, inverse uh, relation with, with the conjugacy. And the, the problem is that uh, reversible maps do not form a group. So you cannot actually compose two reversible maps and then get another reversible map. That doesn't really work. Um, so you need to kind of look at some other properties. And that's where somehow some insights came from that uh, of things that I learned uh, earlier, is that there is a way of actually decomposing reversible maps in, in, in another way. And, and that's a, so where we have a map T, you, kind of, you can write this as R times some map times R times the inverse of this map. And so what you now want to uh, do, you want to, you hope that you can actually write always such a map like this. You can parameterize, or you can learn maybe these maps F1, F2, 2FL. Uh, and um, you just have to prove that somehow now this can approximate kind of all possible reversible systems and stuff like that. Yeah? So that's the, that's the idea. And then you use some kind of like suitable type of maps F, and then you're going to learn these maps F rather than the, uh, you know, the map T. Good. So the theorem here, which I just state here, and I say any star, <laughs> so there's a star there because it's not any, but there's some, you know, it has to be isotopic to the identity and some other trivial properties, but basically any reversible diffeomorphism can be written in this form, R, G, R, G inverse, and if it's symplectic, then actually we can choose G to be symplectic. Um, and that's not very useful. So the only thing that I need to learn is actually G. So, you know, I just basically, rather than using a general map, I just learn uh, G. And that's where the structure comes in. And the G, I can you know, approximate, for instance, by composition of Hinon maps or by a kind of other, uh, other result of, of how, to, how to find kind of like a good approximations. So I'm going to just show some results now on the Hinon Heil system, which is just, uh, again, a very old classical system. Uh, Coming from uh, the 60s, Hanon and Hiles, uh, so some problem uh, which is which is often discussed, and you people know you can find a return map and so on. And so, on. but we don't know the equations, of course, of this return map because uh, it's not not the, to be done analytically. So here you see some uh, two of these examples. I had the driven pendulum on the right hand side. I have the Hanon and Hiles system on the left, and I have some data uh, of points, uh, blue and red points of, of initial point and, and and the next iterate, and try to learn the system. So here are some, uh, some, uh, some examples. So the, the left hand is basically some unstructured learner, so it doesn't really do that well. Um, SimpNet is another uh, symplectic uh, structure uh, uh, learn where the, you, you, you have some kind of like, it looks a bit better, but it doesn't really look like it uh, should be looking. On the right hand side is uh, just only the time reversible network. So just only reversibility, no symplectic structure. So just by kind of eyeball metric, it seems to be that the reversible one already uh, wins it here, even from the symplectic one in some sense. Um, but if you look more carefully, somehow you also see that actually the reversible symplectic one does a lot better also than the reversible one. And so we have three systems, the left is the symplectic one, right is the uh, symplectic reversible one, and in the, in the middle is the reversible one. For the same system, learning try to learn data. And in the bottom, there's some pictures show the uh, differences. So, okay, here there's some, some pictures you cannot really read, but uh, in some sense these pictures are supposed to show that Yes, the reversible equivariant one, the one with more structure, learns a lot more efficiently. Not so surprising, but you think that, you know, there is just more information of the system, so you don't need to learn that. Um, but they, it's not always uh, obvious that this actually should, should be the case. So one thing which could be a problem in this kind of uh, things, the more structure you, pr you present, the difference also your optimization landscape look like. And it may well be that actually if you put more structure in that the optimization landscape looks a little bit different. So it's not a given that somehow this always learns faster, but in this uh, setting, for instance, it does learn faster. Good, so this is just an example of, of, of uh, st structure preserving learning. Um, so my message in some sense, uh, as I, I, I think it is with learning uh, dynamics or understanding dynamics from equation of motion, it's important to, to understand the structure, I think. Um, and I think this is also the message of physics informed learning to some extent, where people say like, try to use uh, the universe that you know you're in, don't try to learn just kind of approximations uh, because um, it, it is important to get something that has some meaning as well. 
And so I just uh, illustrated this in reversible symplectic systems. And actually, the main motivation I have is to do more, look more generally in, in, in equivariant learning and equivariant learning algorithms. Uh, so this was just basically a, a bit of a side issue. I think an outlook, which is also very interesting here, is if you have data, try to learn a paradigm, try to learn some kind of like uh, structure in a system, you know, which may be approximately there, and, and, and try to kind of use that in some sense. You know? So that, don't just kind of approximate dynamics, but try to also learn structure. And maybe that is also very useful. If you think of from the physics paradigm, I would say physicists, uh, they often learn kind of paradigms. So it's, you know, it's like Newton's law, it's very difficult to observe it, but it's a good paradigm. So the question is like, how can you learn machine learning an approximate structure, an idealized structure, and then say, well, we are only perturbation away from this maybe, and this actually gives much more insights than just kind of blatant finding the best approximation. Okay, it's uh, supposed to be a short talk. I think it did reasonably well. Okay, thank you very much.